We're on our third week of freedom and uh, discovering the divine you, that God has made you with a purpose. He has a plan for you. When you were designed by God, he had your mind when he made you before you even were made. We believe that. And uh, I just want to mention one other thing I forgot to mention. We are in the midst of our 21 days of fasting and prayer. Every morning uh, from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m., we have a service here Monday through Friday. I want to encourage you to come. Uh, you can also come online as well. and You can participate with us. We're taking this time to give God the first part of our lives in the year of 2016. And we believe that's part of the spiritual warfare of finding freedom is God, giving God the very first and the very best of our years. This is why we come to church on Sunday, give the first day of the week. We believe in giving first to God and all that we do. And so this is all the process we're going through. We've been talking about freedom and how God wants us to have freedom. It's for freedom that Christ has died. God has died through Jesus Christ to bring us freedom, to pay the price, to release us from the sin of self and the sin from the enemy. God wants to give us freedom. But the truth is, you and I struggle with freedom because we're not completely free. I'm going to show you back to our original uh, scriptures we've been talking about this whole time. If you want to catch up on the series, Freedom, you can go to cornerstonecheshire.com and catch up on it. But I'm going to go right into today's message without rehashing what we talked about. Uh, John 8, 31 to 36. Jesus is speaking to the people of his church of his day. This is what he says. Then Jesus said to those who believed in him, which was the church of Jesus' day, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And the truth is in the person. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Now, if the truth sets you free, what can hold you in bondage? A lie, right? And so that's why we want to get the truth in our hearts and in our minds. And so that's what it says right here. And then you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, the church, we're Abraham's descendants. Hey, I've been coming to church uh, for all my life. I've been coming to Cornerstone since I was this tall. You know, I've been, I've been coming to church, and I've been involved with Christian Bible studies, and I've been involved with memorizing Scripture and all that. So what do you mean? Uh, be set free. I am free. And after all, when you give your life to Christ, the enemy can't touch you anymore. You have no more bondage, you know? Uh, there's no such thing. I'm free in Christ, and the enemy's been defeated in my life, and I'm walking in victory all the time. That's true and false, which we'll share with you in a few moments. And so they, they said, we're Abraham's descendants, verse 33, and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say we will be made free? Many in the church would say today, hey, the enemy's been defeated. I can have no darkness in my life. The enemy has no access to my point. And there's these Christians out there that believe a, demon, a Christian can be demon-possessed, and I don't believe that, and I don't believe it either, by the way. I don't believe a Christian can be demon-possessed in the English translation, which means the, the demon has ownership of you. And it's, oh, no, he's talking about demons. Yes, there are angels and there are demons, my friends. There's a spiritual realm that's out there. You may not like it. You may not agree with it. You may think it's silly. It's not silly. It's true. If you see the evil perpetrating through the world, you know there's something out there that's controlling it. There is evil on this planet. And there are good forces and there are bad forces. And we're going to explain it a little bit more in a, in a few moments about it. And so they said to this, they said, we're, we're Abraham's descendants. How can you say we'll be made free? And Jesus answered them saying this, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits a sin is a slave to sin. In other words, they're in bondage. And a slave does not abide. Now listen to me ask you a question. How many of you have sinned today? Only three of you. We have the most <laughs> holy church this side of heaven. If you sin, you're a slave to sin. Why? Because you don't want to sin, neither do I. We have this propensity to sin. We have the sin nature. If you and I no longer sinned, we wouldn't need Jesus Christ. We'd be perfect. But the fact of the matter is, you and I sin. So all of us are in bondage one way or another. This is the issue. We've been saying it every single week. If you don't believe you can be in bondage, then how can you be free? The first step in finding freedom is to realize that you are in bondage to other things. And so this is what we, we got to realize. And then the Bible says, Jesus is saying here, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. And there's a lot of connotations based upon that scripture. But one of the connotations is this. You miss out on all the sonship and all the freedom that you have, God has for you. God has freedom for us. It's something that you and I should experience on an ongoing basis. It's like buying an old house. 
an old house, you know, they're so flippant. When they, they, take a, they buy a piece of junk house, right? And they, they redo it and they, they make it beautiful. God wants to do that in your life and my life. So how do believers, can a demon come into a believer? Well, we don't necessarily believe, as we talked about last week, that a Christian can be demon-possessed, but a, a Christian can be demonized. In other words, can be under the influence of a demon. Just like if you have too much uh, NyQuil, <laughs> hey, all right, you're under the influence, right? You're under, you, a NyQuil doesn't, <laughs> I don't like NyQuil, anyhow. It doesn't, you're not under the influence of alcohol, it doesn't own you, but if you drink it, you're drunk, right? If you drink too much, you're under the influence. And so maybe you're not, under, you're not demon possessed, but you can be demon controlled to a certain degree. Now, this may make you feel really uncomfortable, but just bear with me, okay? I want to encourage you, by the way, when we read the Bible, I know we have our church traditions we grow up with, and there's nothing wrong with that, but make sure everything you hear and learn, you, you examine it according to Scripture. Don't just take it because I say it. Make sure you go back to the Scriptures and read it for yourself. That's the beauty of the Bible, is that it's God's Word for us today. And I really do believe pretty much what you read is what it is. Uh, you know, it's not that complicated. There are certain passages in the Old Testament that are poetic. There's some things of the, uh, in Revelation a little hard to understand. But generally speaking, the Bible is fairly easy to understand. It says what it says. We've got to believe what it says. And so the Bible talks about if you, are, if you sin, you're a slave to sin. I don't like that very much, but you are, and so am I. We have to recognize that we have that problem. But here's the good news. Therefore... If the Son makes you free, you shall be free, free indeed. That, and that's true. And so, well, then how then do we get in bondage to sin? How do we get more freedom in our lives? And the way we get more freedom in our lives is to have the Lord come in our lives more and more and to recognize that we can give access to the enemy. If I leave my doors unlocked, and if I leave my door open in the summer, how many knows there'll be flies before you know it, Right? The flies will take over the house. I mean, they don't own the house, but they'll be everywhere you want to go. And if you continue to leave the doors open, you'll, suddenly you'll have little mice come in, little rats will come in. <laughs> and pretty short, all the neighborhood kids will start coming in. <laughs> and then your house will be taken control by kids and mice. Uh, so, you know, you open the door, you allow things to come in. If you shut the door, you keep it out. There should be an old song. Shut the door, keep out the devil. Shut the door, keep the devil in the night. Okay, I'm, I'm dating myself. <laughs> It'll be all right. Okay. Esteban, can we do that next week? Okay. <laughs> kind of a little, kind of a South Seas. Okay, whatever it is. Uh, but, um, but we can give the enemy access point. And many say it can't happen, but it can. Does God give permission to the devil? Yes, he does. I want to make something abundantly clear. God is stronger than the devil. Absolutely, there's not two different forces. It's not like, you know, I mean, I know I love Star Wars. I do. I enjoy it. You will come to church every Sunday, okay? <laughs> <laughs> if it worked, we'd be, okay. I like Star Wars. It's fun, you know, and you know, dark force and the good force and all that. But it's not, it's just fantasy. And people believe that there is a yin and the yang and we have to have, no. There, the God is so much stronger than the enemy. It's not even a contest, which I'll show you in a few moments. So does God ever give permission? Absolutely, he gives permission. How do you know that? The Bible says so. Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. I mentioned this last week. I'm going to go a little deeper into it. The Bible says, be angry. And you're like, yeah, praise God. The Bible says I can be angry. No. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Listen, if you're in a relationship and you have things in your family, don't let stuff go on for days and days and days and be angry. You know what that does? That opens the door to the enemy in your life. Look what it says. Continue on, please. Okay, I'll read it from my notes. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give a place to the enemy. I don't know about you, but I don't want him um, coming into my life. And if I'm angry and I let sin come in or I don't forgive somebody or when my, my wife and I, we get in an argument and you're like, you know what, I'm not going to deal with her. I'm going to blow her off. Guess what that does? The enemy comes right in. I'm thankful to say my wife and I, we solve issues every day. We never let a day go by without selling something. I'm never angry with her more than two seconds because if I do, I'll get hit in the head. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm really seriously. My wife and I, we take this seriously. We don't let a day go by without settling something. Now, what I have learned, and I said this before, sometimes we recognize the fact when we're tired, uh, especially me, I don't think clearly. So we say, you know what? We're, we're going to resolve this tomorrow. We're just too tired to deal with it. But we're going to deal. We don't let a day go by without dealing with issues. Some of you let stuff go on for, for years and years and years. When you have a dirty plate, wash it off immediately. There's been times I've let, I've let cornflakes stay on the, on the plate. I let it on the counter, right? I come back about three hours later. You need a, you need a hacksaw to get that thing off. <laughs> it's so much easier to clean the dishes of your marriage, of your relationships, when you go right to the water of Christ and wash it with the word. Don't let the enemy have a foothold in your life. And we're going to show you, I'm going to show you a secret today that I've never seen before until this past week. But you've got to hold on. I'm going to keep me. Okay. So, be angry and do not sin. Do not give the place to the devil. Now, the Bible says in the New Testament, you can give a place to the devil. And I don't want to give a place to him, but he looks for access points. Okay? So we can open the door to the enemy. And I will say to you today, as I looked at it, I thought about, well, we could deal with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. We can deal with all these issues. I thought, well, it'll be a three-week series. But I said, no, what's the common denominator for all sin? I begin to look at it more and more and more. I realized that there's one common denominator to all sin. You know what it is? Pride. P-R-I-D-E. Pride. Pride is the access point. Well, how do you know that? Well, the Bible talks about it. I'll show you in a few moments. Pride is trusting in your own strength. That's part of pride. Not the total thing. We'll be talking about the different aspects of pride. Trusting in your own strength. And I've found people that say, you know, I, I, a lot of people I know are proud of the fact that they're not proud. <laughs> I don't have an issue with pride. I'm fine. I would venture to say that every person in this room, including me, struggles with pride and Let's pride take control of our lives to a certain degree. People may not know it, but you and I struggle with it. Well, how do you know? I'll show you in a minute. What is pride? What is pride? Well, let me say something else about pride. I've been around the church all my life since I was born. I was probably conceived in church. I mean, I've been, I've been in church all my life. <laughs> that came across the wrong way. Mom and Dad, if you're watching, oh my Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was a prophetic word. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> what I meant to say, I was always in church, okay? <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Uh, but anyhow, let me just move on. I'm digging myself in a big hole. Um, but I've been in church all my life, and I've seen many, many people throughout the, my life. And I've, it's easy to pick on people that are involved with drugs and alcohol, and, and they're involved with gambling, they're involved with uh, promis promiscuity, they're involved with, oh, yeah, they got problems. But you know what I've seen? I've seen the, the one that takes down the people that I trust the most and love the most. I've seen mature believers that I have vouched for. If I could be like him or I could be like her, I would be so happy if my life could represent this spiritual giant that I look at. You know what happens to that spiritual giant? They end up falling. I'm like, oh my gosh, if they can fall, how can I make it? I even worked for a, a very prestigious pastor at a church of over 6,000 people. Was a, wrote a book contract and was well-versed. And, you know, and I had the opportunity to work with him. And I really looked up to him a lot. And I found he was a human being after working with him. And I saw issues. I'm like, man, I guess I'm too hard on him. And later on, he ended up falling. And a lot of it was pride. I've seen people that I've trusted and loved dearly fall because of pride. And I would say mature believers struggle with this. It, it kind of gets in there because no one else knows about it. Pride is a major problem. Let me explain to you a little bit about pride. Pride is the biggest door in your house. It's the front door. It's a double door. And if, if the enemy can get into that door, he has an access. He's got a master key. And if you have the pride key, then he can get into every other area of your life. We can deal with lust, we can deal with, uh, we can deal with other issues, but you know what? If we don't deal with pride, all those other issues mean nothing because this is the major thing. Well, how do I know that's the case? Well, let me tell you the origin of Satan. Do you know that before the earth was created, before we have what we have, the origin of sin, the origin of evil happened? Look to your Bibles, please, at Isaiah 14, starting at verse 12. 
from Isaiah. How you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. There was a great angel named Lucifer. He was one of the most powerful angels. He was part and it was around the glory of God. God made him absolutely beautiful. It was called the son of the morning star. How you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. You who weaken the nations. Make no mistake. He's out in the nations, including ours. Influencing and dealing with world leaders and dealing with people like you and I. I don't think Satan has ever personally bothered with me because he's got other people, other fish to fry in the world. But he is the commander in chief. Just like, for example, right now we have troops in Afghanistan. A Barack Obama, our president, is not in Afghanistan, but he's the commander in chief of our country. You follow that? Okay, so the enemy, the devil, is the commander-in-chief of evil forces, and he has all kinds of lesions of, of devils and demons in different categories. You can see it in Scripture. And so what happened is, he's talking about Lucifer, son of the morning, how you've been cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said, not to the congregation, not to your friends, not to your family, you said what? In what? Your heart. What does Jesus talk about when he, when he talks about sin? He who thinks, who hates his brother in his heart. It all starts here, right? So, you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I'm going to go higher than God. I'm going to go higher than God. I'm going to be greater than God. One of the greatest tests that you and I will ever face in our life is success. When everything goes your way. Everything you touch turns to gold. You sell your stock before it drops 300 points. You know, you buy stuff, you know, and everything goes perfect. Everything you do is perfect. That's when it's difficult, when you have success. That's the big test. For you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my, my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mo mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. In other words, I'm going to be higher. The farthest side. What's the farthest side of the north? You can't go any higher than that. He wants to go higher than God. I will exalt myself above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the most high. Now that sounds noble. Do you, what's, the, what's one of the major temptations in the Garden of Eden? Have this fruit and you will be what? Like God. Oh yeah. If you're like God, you know better. You know what I've, you know what I've found? And this is what I've found, that a little success can be dangerous. I've known people uh, through my life and had their opportunity. I've known people that were very, 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 very wealthy. I've known multi, multi millionaires, and if you, uh, before I came to this church, okay, and I've even known people in this area. I've known someone from the Edwards family, uh, the Jonathan Edwards, and this guy is like the great, great grandson of that great reformist, and he's very wealthy and just manages the estate. And just, he's a very humble guy. He drives a normal car, he talks normal. And then I've known people that just get a new pay raise and are making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, and you think they're Donald Trump. <laughs> and they walk around and oh yeah I got this I got I got and they're just bragging how rich they are you know and, and they're kind of arrogant sometimes when you get blessing right away you don't realize it but I sometimes find that old money people that have been around a while and, 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 and understand what wealth can do and what wealth cannot do a little more humble than people that get it right away and sometimes success can really destroy a person and so it, when you are humble God will trust you and he'll lift you up and one of the ways you're humble is by trusting God with everything you have and so the Bible says here, he says, I will send over the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Verse 15, yet you shall be brought down to Seol to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze on you and consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook the kingdoms? And we're giving the devil a pit bull, German shepherd jaw, and he's a little poodle. He's not that big. The, the strength of the enemy is the strength we give him. I'm going to give you a great theological discourse for a few seconds. I know it might be really deep for many of you. So I know, oh, no, he's going to get really deep. So, you know, I'm going to go to the deep side of theology, okay? Uh, is this all right, everybody? Okay. Well, on um, um, VeggieTales, 
There's an episode <laughs> called The Fib from Outer Space. Actually, the rumor weed, or The Fib from Outer Space, there's two of them. And this little pea thing falls, from, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just going to give you the theology of, of Veggie Tales. This little thing falls to the ground, and a little junior sees it. And this little pea tries to get him to lie. And every time he lies, the thing gets bigger. Come on, Junior. Okay. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the more he lies, the bigger it gets until it's a huge monster. And Larry Boy has to come and save the day. Well, listen, when you and I give in to sin, when you and I give in to pride, you know what happens? It gets bigger. When you give the enemy access point and you feed the enemy, he gets bigger. The strength of the enemy comes from you and I giving him power. And we give power how we think and how we act. Make no mistake about it. But the good news, he says, I saw Satan trembling. And Jesus even said in Luke chapter 10, verse 18 and 19, you know, you know how hard the battle was between the devil and God? You think it was, you know what he said? Get out. Shroom. Like lightning, I saw Satan fall. There was no contest, folks. Boom, done. And so the enemy would try to get us to think he's too powerful or he's too weak. The truth is, the power he has is the power you and I give him. Make no mistake about it. So, I want to show you something about, about pride a little bit. Peter, I love Peter, and we all love Peter. We always use him for examples. But Peter was a great man of God. He walked on the water. He did tr tremendous things. In Luke chapter 20, 22, verse 31, this might mess with you a little bit here. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you. What? Yeah, the devil has asked to mess with Peter. The devil has asked you that he may sift you as wheat, may beat you up and really destroy you. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you've returned to me, strengthen your brother. Satan has asked to sift you like leek. Let me tell you something, a principle, very important. The enemy cannot touch you unless it first goes through God. The enemy cannot touch me or you unless it goes through God. That should bring comfort to you. But yeah, but what am I grandmother, why did my mother die of cancer? Why did this person have this? Why does my child have this problem? I, I think, no. Let me explain something to you. Everything has to go through God. Then why does God allow bad things? That's next week. <laughs> I'm lying. Okay. We will deal with that another, another time. But you know what happened is the, the, the Greek word for pride it has many different forms of it. But when the word, the Greek word for ask, you know what it means here? It means to ask or receive permission or to demand permission. Satan is saying, hey, let me in Peter's life. What was the access point of Peter? Why, did the, why was the enemy so emboldened to come to Jesus and say, hey, let, him in, let me in, let me in, let me in, let me in. You need to let me in. Why? And, Satan, and, and Jesus allowed Satan to mess with Peter. Why? Because he had a pride issue. Let me show you. Let me show you. What was Peter's open door? His open door was the big door, the big mama door that gives, you the, that gives you the master key. It's called pride. Mark 14, 27. Look what Jesus says here. And Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. This is the night he was betrayed and uh, went to the, uh, when he was arrested. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you in Galilee. But watch Peter. Peter said to him, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. He was genuine. He loved Jesus. Hey, hey Jesus, you can count on me. I'm an avenger. All right? I, I can handle this, Jesus. I will not. Those other people, pff, they might. The rest of the church, pff, you know, I follow God. Everyone else in the church, they, they, I got it together. This is Peter talking here. He, he says, even if all else fall. And what happens later on, by the way, you see Jesus restore. He says, do you love me more than these? He goes back to the wound, which is another time. But he says, even if all fall away, I will not. Peter said to him, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, as surely I say to you today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. So Jesus just tells Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And what does Peter do? He challenges Jesus. Talk about having gall. 
He says, he, more vehemently, if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. He was arrogant. I got this. I don't have any problem with pride. I don't have no problem with that. I'm over that now. I'm good. I'm good to go. It was pride. You know, I want to show you another example about Peter and pride, okay? If you can turn to your Bibles, please, to Matthew 16. Just bear with me a little bit. 16, verse 21. Jesus is walking to Caesarea Philippi. He said, who do people say the Son of Man is? And Peter has an epiphany. Thou art the Son of God. And Jesus says, flesh and blood did not reveal to you, but my Father in heaven. And Peter, on this rock, on the testimony that you first said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. Thank you, Jesus. Gave him a promotion, right? Okay, nothing wrong going like this, by the way. Actually, it's good for your posture. Uh, but anyhow, uh, and so verse 16, verse 21 of chapter 16 of Matthew from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and to be raised from the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. How can, I mean, talk about, hey, Jesus, I'm going to rebuke you. He says, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Peter. I'm sorry. I changed the Bible because I don't like it. Because I, I don't think a Christian could have Satan. So I'm not gonna, I want to change it because I don't believe that's going to happen. Okay, if that's all right, everybody. Okay, no, it's not. Get behind me, Satan. He's speaking to the spirit that's animating Peter. A moment ago, the spirit of God was upon him. Now a demonic spirit, Satan himself, the big S. Lucifer is influencing him. But you think, you know, it seems like it's a noble thing. He wants to protect his friend Jesus. They want Jesus to get hurt. He's his savior. Far be it from you, God. Why? Why? What happened? Well, I'll tell you why. He says, get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. He began to look at the kingdom of God through the kingdom of man, and the kingdom of man was never chosen to rule without God leading him. And so there's a problem. Sp Peter spoke arrogantly. What part do you not understand? And, and Jesus rebukes him. And he speaks to Satan as a man. Now, people struggle with this. Well, how can God allow the enemy to be used? Well, have you ever read the Old Testament? Uh, if you want to read a book that really uh, illustrates this point very quickly, is the book of Judges. People will follow God, they'll turn away from God. So what does God do? He lets the enemies, the Philistines rise up, to persecute them till they believe, till they get back. To, God will use the enemy for his own purposes. And the stuff going on in the world, when the world falls apart, it's all falling together. God's got this thing in the end times too, by the way, folks. We don't have to fear because God is in charge of it all. And so what does Peter do after that? You know what happens later on. He gets a sword out and he chops the ear off the guard. He tries to go for its head. He's, he's trying it in his own way. He misses the point. Now, going to Mark chapter 14, do you realize that, that here's Peter. I'll never deny you. I'll never go against you. If everyone else leads you, Jesus, you can count on me. You know what happens? A teenage waitress intimidates him so much that he actually swears about his allegiance to Jesus. Look at this. When Jesus was being betrayed, uh, when he was being, under, um, being tried, Mark 14, 66. Now, as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you are also with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're saying. And he went on the porch as the rooster crowed. Lord God, if everyone else denies you, I will not. And what happens? A little teenage girl comes up to him. And he denies him. And the servant girl, verse 69, and the servant girl saw him again and began to say with those who stood by, this is the one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by him said, Peter again, surely you are, you're one of them, for you're a Galilee, your speech shows it. You know, see the Galilee, they're like the southern, hey, how, 
how y'all doing? I'm doing fine. I'm from the South. And I had some grits and bacon. I, mean, I used to live in the South, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. But you know if someone's from the South, you can tell they talk like this a little bit, right? That's some, some grits. and I'm going to do good. And, and they talk like this a little bit. I, I li- I li- and they talk real slow like this. Uh, go over yon. If you're from the South, we absolutely love you because you, you know how to eat well. I'm, I'm going to stop. Okay. So Peter was like a Southerner. He was, Galileans were kind of like, the, the, you know, we're an upper, we're like, we're from New York. And they're from the South. And so that's kind of how they looked at the Galileans, by the way. Which is true. You can see in the, in the literature of the day. So your speech gives it away. Then he began to curse and swear. I mean, he's telling Jesus, if I have to die for you, I will. And now he's swearing. And cursing him, putting curses on himself. And the second time, he says, I do not know the man who you speak. Verse 72, a second time the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said, said to him before the rooster crows twice. You would deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. My friends, it can happen to you and I as well. Pride is a key in our lives. Jesus had to let Peter go through that to build him. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. Let me tell you a little story about my brother, my older brother, David. He's, a, he's seven years older than me. He, he's kind of big bone and he's kind of, you know, kind of, he's, he can be a, probably a, a, a line, you know, he's a pretty big guy, though, we sh- though I'm taller than him. But he was a pretty big guy, seven years older than me, and he was kind of a bully growing up. I have to be honest with you. Uh, 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 for example, we had, I, one time I overflowed the toilet. I've got to tell you, okay? <laughs> and he told me, do you realize you could fall into the toilet and be sucked away? <laughs> I'm in the middle of potty training, and I didn't understand. I thought you had to make boxing gloves. I didn't understand back in those days. So I, 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 ended up, you know, so I got scared, and my parents were upset me for overflowing the toilet. Then my brother says I could be sucked into the toilet. So for a year, I was afraid of toilets. My parents were like, what's wrong with our son? He can't get potty trained. I was mortified with the, with the toilet, thanks to my brother. And then there used to be this program on, on television, you know, chiller. Remember that? With six hands? Scared the heaven out of me. Okay, and my brother said he's gonna get you. He go chiller. He, he was he was hard. he used to tickle me to I cried. He was awful. David, if you're watching, oh yeah. <laughs> but he also had a big mouth. We do have that in common. And, and what he used to do is he used to tease. I can say this. This is over 40 years ago. There were these people in our neighborhood called the Kings. We used to live in, in Yonkers, New York, 50 Rockland Avenue. This doesn't sound like, I live, we live at 50 Rockland Avenue. That sounds real New York, right? I live in a, in a house over there, and there were these neighborhood kids called the Keens. Every neighborhood has Keens. These are the guys that ride the motorbikes through the, ha- through, the, through the streets. They egg people's homes and all that kind of stuff. They're the neighborhood bullies. They make fun of you on the bus. Well, my, my brother David decided to ride his little um, banana seat bike and go down to their house and, and, and th- insult them with different things. Ah, oh, you're a weakling, your mother this, your father this, and he used to say stuff. Then he'd run back home, and he could quickly go inside and shut the door, and, they, and then they, would, they couldn't get at him because he's protecting himself in the house. So these kings, what they did, they started egging our house. They took a hose and turned it on all night long and flooded our porch, and it went into our room. It ended up being a lawsuit against these people. I mean, it was bad. It was bad. And my dad was getting tired of it because the reason why this was happening was because my brother. <laughs> I'm not going to say his name because his name is David. Anyhow, so, <laughs> David, you're watching, please. I'll never see me again. But uh, so what happened was uh, my father got sick of it. So one day my brother, there again, he says, oh, he says something about their mother or whatever. And then he starts running. And they're, they're chasing him. He's like, I'm going to get back. And he goes, let me in, let me in, let me in. And my dad goes, Click. I'm like, yeah. All right. So my mother's like, no. And, and, and so it's almost like one of those movies you used to watch when you were, before you were a Christian where the guy used to walk with the hockey mask coming at you and you're running towards it and you're banging on the door. Let me in, let me in. It was too late. The violins were going and all of a sudden they, they, the Keens come and sure enough, they get in a fist fight. They start punching my brother. My, my, my mom's like, no. And we bam, we go, bam. And he's getting hit. He let him get hit several times, praise God. And then he fell to the floor. <laughs> he fell to the floor, and they're, they're ready to kick him. My dad opens the door. That's enough. My brother never teased the Keens again. He dropped the lawsuit. And that's why I'm here today. No, but sometimes 
My father used the enemy to teach my brother a lesson. God will allow Satan in our lives, but guess what? He's still in charge. He's looking through the blinds, and he will not let the enemy go further than he allows. I can trust God. I've learned to trust God. Though he slay me, I will trust him, the Bible says. I'm going to show you another thing. So the first thing about pride is believing in your own self, that you have all the strength. The second thing would be trusting in your own righteousness. And this is uh, the book of Job. I want to show you what happened in the book of Job. It really gives us a good understanding what takes place in the heavenlies. Now, Job is a poetic book. It is one of the oldest. They believe it's the oldest book in the Bible. And it is written poetically, by the way, but its truths are truth. And it says here, Job chapter 1, verse 6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also... Wait a minute. Wait, oh, wait. The sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them? Wait a minute. I thought you can't have light and dark in the same place. Well, guess what? God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. And is there evil in the world? Okay. So, and so what happens here? And Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where did you come? So he answered him, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth upon it. The Bible says the enemy goes around prowling around like a lion waiting for someone to devour. Verse 8, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in all the earth, a blameless and upright man. For humanly speaking, he was the utmost of what a human being could be. He really was. He's an upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered the Lord and said, yeah, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and all that he has on every side? In other words, I can't, can't touch him. Do, 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 do. I can't touch him. All right, Why? There is a hedge around him that God has placed. My friends, don't fear the enemy because God is stronger than the enemy. And he has a hedge of protection. However, you and I can open the door. Well, how did Job open the door? Well, I'm glad you asked that. We'll see in a few moments. Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the earth. So Satan answered and said, does Job not fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him? Around his household, verse 10, and all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch Stretch forth your hand and, and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So listen, the enemy comes all the time, by the way. And they go to the courts. If, if, if for example, if the police want to check your house out, they have to get what? A warrant, for your, a warrant to go in your house. A warrant for your arrest, right? A warrant to go in your house. You just can't go in your house and see what's going on. They have to go to the courts. Well, what, why should we let you go in their house for? Well, because they've been selling X, Y, and Z, and they've been doing this. I had this evidence. Okay. Because they've acted in this capacity, their rights to privacy have, have now been, uh, they violated that, that right to have privacy, so you can now go in their house and, and a search warrant. Go ahead. Do a search warrant. So now they're able to go in their house because they gave permission. The enemy comes to our life all the time. Comes to God. Hey, hey, I, I, I want to talk. I, I want in Eric. I want to pastor Eric's life right now. Why? You say how he is. He just thinks he's the cast meow now that he built his children's church. <laughs> You're right. He does. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But no, seriously, that's that's what can happen. Is uh, I'm sorry. The dogs bark, not the cats meow. Um, so that's what can happen here. So God grant permission. Now this is what happened. The sons of God came to him. And then for 30, 31 chapters, you read this, this, this. The poor guy goes through so much. And then finally, there was, he had these, these friends that were great for two weeks. And then they started criticizing him, saying, hey, you've opened a door to the enemy in your life. And they started being, they, th they thought they knew everything. And they, what they said was wrong, incidentally. The theology was correct, but it was misapplied. And then finally, at the end of these discourses, we come to a guy named Elihu. In chapter 32. He says, I've held it as long as I could, but now I can no longer hold it anymore. Job, I need to tell you what's really going on. This is what he says. So Job 32, verse 1. 
and tracking with me in Scripture. So these three men ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Who was righteous in his own eyes? Job. I had a person that gave their life to Christ and they couldn't find a job. And they, wrote the, they said, I, I, wrote, I read the book of Job, but I couldn't even find a job. <laughs> this is a heavy subject. I'm just trying to... A spoonful of laughter makes the theology go down. Okay. <laughs> then the wrath of Elah, the son of these two gentlemen, of the family of Ram, was aroused against Job. His wrath was aroused because he justified himself rather than God. The Bible says that Job justified himself. And he even did that before God. In Job 32, 1 and 2, Job justified himself rather than God. Job 33, 8 and 9. Surely you have spoken in my hearing, and I have heard the sound of your words, saying, I am pure without transgression. I am innocent, and there's no iniquity in me. So Elihu says, he says, you know, you think you're better than anyone else. And you know what? He's trying to justify himself. You know what happened after that? In Job 38, I'm going to save time here. God finally has, has it. All these other guys spoke. Now it's God's turn. Look what the Lord says to Job. Job 38, 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. Hey, who do you think you are? You think you're better than anyone else? Job, hello, you're human. Let me show you. He's like, how could God do this to me? God, I've done nothing wrong. I've been good. I, I've helped the poor. I've done this. I've done the other. Uh, and he was a great man. There's no doubt about it. He was fed. Even God said he's a blameless man for humans, from a human standpoint. But he started to justify himself. Finally, God had enough. And then God said the following. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determines its measurements? Surely you know sarcastically, or who stretched the line upon it to what these foundations were fastened, or who laid his cornerstone? And he begins to talk about, do you see where the eagles go? And he gives a poetic thing about all the wonders of creation and the stars. Where were you? Do you know where the lightning comes from, where the hail comes from? And, and Job's like, and you know what Job says at the very end? He says, he says nothing. When he saw the glory of God, all of his questions were answered. He realized that he was prideful. My friends, the big key to Job getting attacked was pride. Pride will get you and I every time if we're not careful. I like what it says in Job 38, 1 through 6. I'll paraphrase. He says, who's this idiot talking? Let me show you what's really going on, Job. I mean, God really gives it to him. He's not messing around. In verse, Job 40, verse 8, would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me? That you may be justified, God says? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Great pride. And I've seen many righteous people, unfortunately, through my life, that have allowed pride to build. Their success, the grace of their lives, they've allowed pride to come. And the Bible says before the fall comes pride. So that's the second. second. The third thing is this. It's the last point. It'll be a lot shorter. Pride is trusting in your own wisdom. There's a, there's a king named Jehoshaphat and Ahab. Ahab was a wicked king, had a wife named Jezebel. They killed over 400 prophets of, of Israel. They were terrible people. And he was a wicked king. Jehoshaphat was a good king. And they made an alliance to go against a common enemy. I'll go ahead and read to you in 1 Kings 27, verse 7. And Jehoshaphat said, is there an, what happened was, uh, they say, hey, before we go to battle, we should ask the Lord first. That's what Jehoshaphat said. We should ask the Lord first before we go to battle. So here we go on. Verse 7. <clears throat> and Jehoshaphat said, is there still no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, yes, there's still one man, Micaiah, the son of Imala, who by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say such a thing. So here we see later on in the same chapter, verse 7, this passage is about Ahab and Elijah. And uh, Elijah saw over 500 prophets killed. I mean, was a wicked, wicked king, horrible king. And then we jump to um, verse, verse 15, same story. 
Then he came to the king and said to him, Shall we go to war against Ramah Gilead, or shall we refrain? And so they asked the prophet. And he answered him, Go prosper, for the Lord will deliver you into the hands of the king. He was saying it sarcastically. Okay, why are you asking me if you can do that? You know the answer already. It's no. But because you want to hear it, go ahead. Do what you want. How many people know people like this? They, they, I mean, if they say that the, the sky is pink and then there's flying elephants, and if you say not, they get in an argument with you. So like, yeah, there's, there's pink elephants. That's right. Yeah, go ahead. Yep, go ahead. Do what you want. If you get to that point with people, they're just so, so stubborn. You don't care anymore. You're like, do what you want to do. <clears throat> and so the king said to him, how many times should this happen? And then I said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each return to his own house. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you this guy would tell me bad news? He wanted to hear good news. But I want to show you something that happened in this process of how the enemy got access to these kings. Let me show you. 1 Kings 22, verse 20. And the Lord said, who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead. So one spoke in this manner, and another spoke in th that manner. Then, this, then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. The Lord said, in what way? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. Listen, this is what happened. It was a fallen angel that said, hey, I'll go ahead and do it. He's been waiting. He's so prideful. He had an access point. God will use, just like, my, just like my brother, he'll use the enemy to teach a lesson. God's in charge. So what happens? I'll put a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go and do there. Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of these prophets. You know how we know that we're on a demonic delusion when there's prophets out there saying, hey, do what you want, man. You're a Christian. You're a Hollywood Christian. You can go and do what you want. The grace of Jesus forgives you. Go ahead and live like you. This is something going on right now. There's a lying spirit in the church today. It's okay to do it as long as you love each other. It doesn't make a difference who you're married. It doesn't make a difference what you do. It's okay. You can do this or the other. Hey, a grace of Jesus forgives all, and it does forgive all. Make no mistake about it, it does. But they make, they make fun. They make light of God. They have no fear of God. And there's a theology out there. There's lying prophets out there. When God says something clear in the Scripture, and something else comes up that, that is not true, guess who wins? The Scripture does. So this is what happened. The Lord said, I will do that. You see, there's a couple of good things. God is in control. The enemy is not stronger than the devil. Wait, the enemy is not stronger than the devil. <laughs> God is stronger than the enemy. The enemy is not stronger than God. No way. So that should bring you assurance and happiness. It does for me. I feel a lot better knowing that nothing can touch me unless it goes through God. The Bible says this, but if you have bitter and envy, uh, James 3, 14, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above. It is earthly, sensual, and demonic. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You know what happens before you fall? You have a haughty spirit. And then pride comes in, and God, you know what the Bible says? Listen to this. James 4, 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud. How many of you want to be resisted by God? Okay, I don't want to be resisted by God. But he gives grace to the humble. Pride goes before the fall. You know what happened, by the way, to King Ahab? A random person shot an arrow, and God directed the arrow, and it ended up killing him. Pride comes before the fall. Pride is a trap. It's a trap to good church people that got their act together. It, it, no matter who you are, my friends, listen, all of us need to examine our lives. Well, I don't have a problem with pride. If you don't think you have a problem with pride, then you have a problem with pride. Because if you're humble about it, the apostle Paul said the more he knew God, he says, uh, what a sinner am I? He knew that, you know, without Christ, all of us 
struggle with sin. Even uh, I've seen a great man, Dr. Jack Hayford, shared with a conference with a bunch of pastors. He said, I'm, I've fallen, I've backslidden. I'm like, oh no, not him too, Lord. He says, I haven't been praying that for my family and the church. I've backslidden. The guy was so close to God that that's what his area. Listen, all of us make mistakes. All of us fall short of the glory of God. There's not one that's righteous. All of us. Yes, Jesus forgives us, and yes, he does that, but you and I still have an issue with sin. And one of the greatest things that the enemy uses against you and against me to get access point is pride. Are you prideful? Well, those people over there, I got this together. No one's as good as I am in this. The most humble people I've ever seen are the most, I've seen Christians that are so successful. It's scary how successful they are, but they're humble. And I've seen, it's like that new money and old money thing. Get a little bit of success, they get a big head. But people that have been around for a long time and have followed God and are going after God, the people I know and respect the most that are closest to God are humble. Not arrogant, they're humble. And I want to encourage you today, you want to get close to God, be humble. Search me, oh God, know my heart. Find me, try me and see if there's any wicked way in me. How do you know you might have a problem with pride? Well, this is some way you might know. Do you have anyone in your life that speaks into your life? Maybe some of you have isolated yourself so no one can speak to you. Well, that can happen. We encourage you to get in the body of Christ. You know how you find freedom? You find freedom in relationships with other believers. Bible says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but an enemy's kisses are profuse. Are you involved with any other people in the church here? Or maybe, if you're not involved, maybe you're the kind of person that can't talk to Johnny about that. No, no, don't, don't mention about that. Don't mention about that area. Mm -mm. And, and, and people are afraid to speak to you about a certain area in your life because they realize that they say something, you explode. So that, that, leave them alone. That's pride. Why not get to the point? And let's, let's, let's have a life. Say, God, search me. Know if I anything wrong with me. God, I want to serve you. I don't want pride to be away. You know what happens in marriages all the time, right? <laughs> She's wrong and I'm right. Or the boss. He's wrong and I'm right. And it happens all the time. You know, you know what pride does? Pride says, I want my rights. You know what a humble word says? You know what? I don't care. You take out the basin like Jesus did and you wash the feet of the disciples. My friends, if you want to be great in the kingdom, you must humble yourself. Jesus was humble. And he had every right to be prideful, but he wasn't. The most wonderful people I've seen are people that are humble. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I, I know this has been a kind of a tough message. Uh, it's, it challenges me, Lord. And Father, I just pray right now, uh, those that are listening to this, whether live or later on or, uh, or here right now, Father, we just pray right now that you'd search our hearts. Holy Spirit, show us, is there any pride in our lives? Lord, when sometimes we think we know it better than you, Lord. Sometimes we look down on people. and Sometimes we think it's by our own strength that we did what we did. If not for your grace, none of us could stand. So Lord, I just pray that you'd show us any areas of our lives in which we have pride. Lord, forgive us for being prideful. Lord, I pray that people would get connected to each other. And Lord, that we'd have relationships where we could encourage each other, build each other up, and sometimes even bring correction out of love. I'm gonna ask you another question. You know, you might think you're good enough. You cannot be good enough no matter how hard you try. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one that's right. No, that's not one. The only way you and I can come before God is through Jesus Christ. It is the level, level playing field. Jesus loves us so much that he gave Jesus himself on the cross. If you want to give your life to Christ today, you can begin a new day. But there's no protection without Jesus. Without Jesus, you're subject to the, the fallen enemy. Let's pray. If you want to give your life to Christ today, you want to pray this prayer today, you don't have to get your act together first. Jesus will take you just like you are, but you have to come to him. He'll help you. He'll love you so much. He'll clean you up, but come as you are. You don't have to get it together first. Jesus takes you just the way you are. If you pray this prayer from your heart, you want to repeat that to me in your own heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I recognize that I am a sinner. And that no matter what I do, it will never be good enough. I thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross, for paying for all of my sins. I receive forgiveness from my sins. Forgive me, Father, 
for all these things that I've done, both known and unknown. And this day, with your help, I give my life to you. I don't have this figured out, God, but what I do figure out is I'm giving my life to you today. Have control of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. With every head bowed, you say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer for the first time or I made a new commitment today. I just see a quick show of hands so we know how to help you a little better. Anyone say, yes, thank you. Anybody else to say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today. I recognize that I have, I gave my life to Christ today. Anyone else today? Okay. Let's all stand if we could. I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way down. We're going to have a closing song. As we do that, we're going to open the front area, which we call the altar. And if you need prayer for anything, we want to pray for you. If you've raised your hand, we want to give you a gift to help you out. I ask you if you could be so kind to fill out this card and say, I've made a commitment to Christ today. And hand it to one of the ushers or put one on the boxes so we can get something to you to help you out. Or come forward and speak to one of the people. Okay? Thank you. Pastor Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his hope. bless you and to keep you. May he shine his face upon you. Go out in his grace and his peace. Love to see you at class 301 today. If you'd like to come, we have open spots. Otherwise, we'll see you tonight with Raymond Mooney. God bless you.